chapter four, section one. What is wrong with a homesteading theory of property? So how do so-called anarcho-capitalists justify property? Looking at Murray Rothbard, we can find that he proposes a, quote, homesteading theory of property. In this theory, it is argued that property comes from occupancy and mixing labor with natural resources, which are assumed to be unowned. Thus, the world is transformed into private property for, quote, title to an unowned resource such as land comes properly only from the expenditure of labor to transform that resource into use. The Ethics of Liberty, page 63. Rothbard paints, paints a conceptual history of individuals and families forging a home in the wilderness by the sweat of their labor. It's tempting to rename his theory the Immaculate Conception of Property, as his conceptual theory is somewhat at odds with actual historical fact. Sadly for Murray Rothbard, his homesteading theory was refuted by Proudhon and What is Property in 1840 along with many other justifications of property alongside it. Proudhon rightly argues that if the liberty of man is sacred, it is equally sacred in all individuals. That is, if it needs property for its objective action, that is, for its life, the appropriation of material is equally necessary for all. Does it not follow that if one individual cannot prevent another from appropriating an amount of material equal to his own, no more can he, can, uh, he can, prevent, uh, can he prevent individuals to come. And if all the available resources are appropriated and the owner draws boundaries, fences himself in, here then is a piece of land upon which, henceforth, no one has a right to step, save the proprietor and his friends. Let this multiply, and soon the people will have nowhere to rest, no place to shelter, no grand ground to till. They will die at the proprietor's door, on the edge of that property which was their birthright. What is property? Pages 84, 85, and 118. As Rothbard himself noted in respect to the aftermath of slavery, see chapter 2, section 1, not having access to the means of life places one the, in the position of unjust dependency on those who do. Rothbard's theory fails because for, quote, we who belong to the proletariat class, property excommunicates us. Proudhon, again, what is property, page 105. And so the vast majority of the population, population's experience, uh, population experience property as theft and despotism rather than as a source of liberty and empowerment, which possession gives. Thus, Rothbard's account fails to take into account the Lockean proviso. And so, for all its intuitive appeal, ends up justifying capitalist and landlord domination. See the next section on why the Lockean proviso is important. It also seems strange that while correctly attacking social contract theories of the state as invalid because no past generation can bind later generations, he fails to see his doing exactly that with his support of private property. A property. Similarly, Ayn Rand argued that any alleged right of one man which necessitates the violation of the rights of another is not and cannot be a right. Capitalism, the unknown ideal, page 325. But obviously, appropriating land does violate the rights of others to walk, use, or appropriate that land. Due to his support for appropriation and inheritance, he's clearly ensuring that future generations are not born as free as the first settlers were. After all, they can't appropriate any land. It's taken. If future generations cannot be bound by past ones, this applies equally to resources and property rights, something anarchists have long realized. There is no defensible reason why those who first acquired property should control its use by future generations. However, if we take Rothbard's theory at face value, we can find numerous problems with it. If title to unowned, unowned resources comes via the expenditure of labor— how can rivers, lakes, and the oceans be appropriated? The banks of the rivers can be transformed, but can the river itself? How can you mix your labor with water? So-called anarcho-capitalists usually blame polluting on the fact that rivers, oceans, and so forth are unowned, but how can an individual transform water by their labor? Also, does fencing in land mean that you have mixed labor with it? 
If so, then transnational corporations can pay workers to just fence in vast tracts of virgin land, such as a rainforest, and so come to own it. Rothbard, ar uh, Rothbard argues that this is not the case. He expresses opposition to arbitrary claims. He notes that it isn't the case that, quote, the first discoverer could properly lay claim to a piece of land by laying out a boundary for the area. He thinks that their claim would still be no more than the boundary itself and not to any of the land within, for only the boundary will have been transformed and used by men. <laughs> However, if the boundary is private property and the owner refuses others' permission to cross it, then the enclosed land is in inaccessible by others. <laughs> if an enterprising right libertarian builds a fence around the only oasis in a desert and refuses permission to cross it to travelers unless they pay his price, which is everything they own, then the person has appropriated the oasis without transforming it by his labor. The travelers have the choice of paying the price or dying. And the Oasis owner is well within their rights of letting them die. Given Rothbard's comments, it is probable that he will claim that such a boundary is null and void as it allows arbitrary claims, although this position is not at all made clear by him. After all, the fence builder has transformed the boundary and unrestricted property rights in what right libertarianism, uh, uh, um, after all, the fence builder has transformed the boundary and unrestricted property rights is what right libertarianism is all about. And of course, Rothbard ignores the fact of economic power. A transnational corporation can transform far more virgin resources in a day than a family could in a year. Transnationals mixing their labor with the land does not spring into mind reading Rothbard's account of property growth, but in the real world, that's what will happen. If we take the question of wilderness, a topic close to many eco-anarchists and deep ecologists' hearts, we run into similar problems. Rothbard states clearly that, quote, Libertarian theory must invalidate any claim to ownership of land that has never been transformed from its natural state. He presents an example of an owner who has left a piece of his legally owned land untouched. If another person appears who does transform the land, it becomes justly owned by another, and the original owner cannot stop them. And should the original owner use violence to prevent another settler from entering this never-used land and transforming it into use— they also become a, quote, criminal aggressor. Rothbard also stresses that he is not saying the land must continually be in use for, uh, for it to be valid property. Citation included it's page 30, uh, 63 and 64 of the Ethics of Liberty. After all, that would justify landless workers seizing the land from landowners during a depression and working for it themselves. So where does that leave wilderness? In response to ecologists who oppose the destruction of the rainforest, so-called anarcho-capitalists suggest that they put their money where their mouth is and buy the rainforest land. In this way, it's claimed that rainforest will then be protected. As ecologists desire the rainforest because it is wilderness, they're unlikely to transform it by human labor. It's precisely that, that they want to stop. From Rothbard's arguments, it's fair to ask whether logging companies have a right to transform the virgin wilderness owned by ecologists. After all, it meets Rothbard's criteria. It is still wilderness. Perhaps it will be claimed that fencing off land transforms it, hardly what you imagine mixing labor with domain, but never mind. But that allows large companies and rich individuals then to hire workers to fence in vast tracts of land and to recreate the land monopoly by a libertarian route. But... As noted already above, fencing off land does not seem to imply that it becomes property in Rothbard's theory. And so, of course, fencing in areas of rainforest disrupts the local ecosystem. Animals cannot feel freely travel, for example, which is, again, what ecologists are trying to stop. Would Rothbard accept a piece of paper as transforming land? Doubtful. After all, in his example, the wilderness owner did legally own it. And so most ecologists will have a hard time in this so-called anarcho-capitalism. Wilderness is just not an option. 
As an aside, we should note that Rothbard fails to realize, and this comes from his worship of the market and his Austrian economics, is that people value many things which do not appear on the market. He claims that wilderness is a valueless, uh, is a valueless unused natural object. For it, if people, uh, uh, for it, people valued them, they would use them, i.e. appropriate them. But unused things may be of considerable value to people, wilderness being a classic example. And if something cannot be transformed into private property, does that mean people do not value it? For example, people value community, stress-free working environments, meaningful work. If the market cannot provide these, does that mean that they do not value them? Of course not. See, Julia Shores, the overworked American, on how working people's desire for shorter, work, shorter working hours was not transformed into options on the market. More on this. Moreover, Rothbard's homesteading theory actually violates his support for unrestricted property rights. What if a property owner wants part of their land to remain wilderness? Their desires are violated by the homesteading theory. Unless, of course, fencing things off equals transforming them, which apparently it does or does not. We're sort of uncertain at this point. How can companies provide wilderness holidays to people if they have no right to stop settlers, including large companies, homesteading that wilderness? And, of course, where does Rothbard's theory leave hunter-gatherers or nomad soci nomadic societies? They use the resources of the wilderness, but they don't transform them. In this case, you can't easily tell if virgin land is empty or being used as a resource. If a troop of nomadic, uh, if a troop of nomadic humans finds its traditionally used but natural oasis appropriated by a homesteader, what are they to do in this system? If they ignore the homesteader's claims, he can call upon his defense firms to stop them. And then, in true Rothbardian fashion, the homesteader can refuse to supply water to them unless they hand over all of their possessions. See chapter four, uh, chapter 4, section 2, next section, on this. And if the history of the United States, which is obviously the model for Rothbard's th uh, theory, is anything to go by, such people will become criminal aggressors and be removed from the picture. Which is, of course, another problem with Rothbard's account. It is completely ahistoric. And so, as already noted above, it's more like immaculate conception of property. He's transported capitalist man into the dawn of time and constructed a history of property based upon what he is trying to justify. Not surprisingly, as he does, with the, uh, as he does this with his natural law theory uh, too. See section 7, um, more on that. What is interesting to note though, is that the actual experience of life on the U.S. frontier, the historic example Rothbard wants to claim, was far from the individualistic framework he builds upon it. And ironically enough, it was destroyed by the development of capitalism. As Murray Bookchin noted, quote, the independence that the New England Yemenary enjoyed was itself a function of the cooperative social base from which it emerged to barter homegrown goods and objects, to share tools and implements, to engage in common labor during harvesting time in a system of mutual aid, indeed to help newcomers in barn raising, corn husking, log rolling, and the like, was in the indispensable cement that bound scattered farmsteads into a united community. Third Revolution, Volume 1, page 233. Bookchin quotes David P. Satsmary, author of a book on, Shea, on the Shea Rebellion, stating that it was a society based upon, quote, cooperative, community-oriented interchanges and not a basically competitive society. Into this non-capitalist society came capitalist elements. Market forces and economic power soon resulted in the transformation of this society. Merchants asked for payment in specie, which along with taxes, soon resulted in indebtedness and the dispossession of the homesteaders from their land and goods. In response, Shea's Rebellion started, a rebellion which was an important factor in the centralization of state power in America to ensure that popular input and control over government were marginalized and that the wealthy and elite and their property rights were protected against the many. 
See Bookchin, again, The Third Revolution, for more details on this at length. Thus, the homestead system was undermined, essentially, by the need to pay for services, as demanded by merchants. So while Rothbard's theory has a certain appeal, reinforced by watching too many Westerns, imagine, it fails to justify the unrestricted property rights theory and the theory of freedom Rothbard derives from it. All it does is end up justifying capitalist and landlord domination, which is, well, probably what it was intended to do. <laughs> 